Uh, so welcome everyone to our Implementation Science Beachside Chat. My name is Allison Hamilton and I lead the UCLA Rapid Rigorous Relevant Implementation Science Hub funded by NIMH, a supplement to CHIPS led by Dr. Steve Shoptaw. Uh, thank you all so much for joining our Beachside Chat. I hope many of you have attended these in the past and know uh, what they're about. For anyone who has never attended a beachside chat, these are really meant to be informal discussions with leaders in implementation science. We are so thrilled about our panel today, which I will uh, introduce in just a moment. Um, but and we do these oh, every quarter or so, uh, and uh, they're all recorded and available on our YouTube playlist, which we'll show you at the end. So most of the time, even though you see slides now. Most of the time we will not be looking at slides. We'll be chatting with our illustrious group of implementation scientists today and um, also fielding questions from you all. Uh, so please feel free to put your questions in the chat. We have questions uh, ready, but we also know that you are going to have a lot of questions, especially in this particular Beachside chat. So welcome and thank you so much for being here today. Um, Elena, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So our topic today is what's new with the updated CIFR, and we have none other than Ms. Laura Dam Schroeder to talk with us about what's new with the updated CIFR. So thank you so much, Laura, for taking the time to join us today. And also joining us, we have Dr. Matt Chinman, who's one of our hub's consultants and is going to be doing work on the CIFR moving forward, along with Dr. Sherry Rogal, who will be joining um, in just a little bit. So welcome to the two of you and soon to the three of you. And thanks again for um, being willing to, to chat with me about the new updated CIFR. This is going to be really fun. We want to just get a quick feel from all of you. Um, we, don't, we don't have an official poll, so if you could just put in the chat um, how familiar you are with the updated CIFR, um, and that'll just give us a feel for how much we need to go into about the updated version. So I'm seeing a lot of C and D, old version. We have a lot of variety. Thanks, everyone. I think we have a, a, a good mix, Laura. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. All right. As those uh, answers roll in, I think we can come out of the slides for now, um, Elena, and then we'll return to them uh, toward the end of the session, where we have just some resources for you and the link to our playlist, etc. So I think if we um, can jump right in and just talk a little bit of history for a few moments, if you don't mind, Laura, and just um, if you could share with us, you know, as you were developing CIFR, did you have any idea how much it would, first, I should just say, CIFR, in case anyone doesn't know, is the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. Uh, it is a, an incredible consolidation of over 100 um, theories, models, frameworks. So it really pulls in, uh, you know, so many different perspectives um, and dimensions of implementation research and has been uh, tremendously influential in the field. I would say it's probably the most recognized framework that we have. Um, and when you were developing it, did you have any idea that it would become what it's become? Absolutely no idea. And I, <laughs> I really, first of all, thank you for the invitation to be here today. I've, I've been looking forward to this because it's an opportunity to reflect um, kind of backwards, especially with this first question, but then also to reflect forward as well and really want to encourage people to put your thoughts, reflections, questions into chat um, um, so that this really is a dialogue. I don't want to do all the talking. Matt, Sherry, and I don't want to do all the talking. <laughs> Um, but on this first question, did I have any idea where we would end up and be able to predict this? Absolutely not. I will tell you that this paper was actually one of the reviewers called it 
a labor of love because they could see all the words that we are, you know, all the work that we had put into it. It kept me up many, many nights. I was, um, I was, I was anxious about it because I didn't know how it was going to be received. And, you know, it was so, I don't know, I felt like it was so different and such a new area for us. Um, but the original seed of the idea for the CFER actually came from Julie Lowley, who's the senior author on both of the papers, the original and the updated. And the idea was that we wanted to have a one-stop shop of what are the variables, and she's very quantitatively oriented, so it's like, what are the variables, what are the factors that we're supposed to be paying attention to, and remember, this is, you know, early 2000s, mm -hmm. um, and, and we didn't know what implementation research was, or translation, and what does this mean, and trying to get a bunch of clinical uh, trialists to think about, you know, get their head out of that space and into a space of thinking about implementation itself was just a, a, a mind tease um, at that stage. And so, you know, we were trying to figure out what is this whole kind of discipline, this new thing, and then what should a framework look like? And who are we to even say what a framework should look like? But um, so, so really, it was a, a selfish goal to, you know, kind of establish and put out there all of the, you know, because when we went to the literature, there was just such a, a um, well, you've heard the term Tower of Babel mm -hmm. of, of all, you know, what things we should look at and how to define them and how to measure or assess them. So that was the original idea of the CIFR. Um, I went back and looked at, you know, what it took to get that paper published and also remember that the journal Implementation Science was brand new at that point. I think it yep. was just a couple of years old, maybe. And it took over a year. It took 15 months from the time of the first submission to when it was published 15 months later. There wow. were four rounds of reviews and six rounds of copy editing. It took me six rounds to finally realize, you know what, I need to stop reading this because anytime you read it, you find just like one more little thing. And if there was one more little thing, they would send it back again. <laughs> they don't do that anymore. I think they learned as well. But all that to say, it took a lot to get this over the finish line. Um, since its publication, you know, it's it's um, been in the top five most accessed um, articles within that journal. Um, it's got almost 10,000 citations within Google Scholar, almost um, uh, 6,000 in Web of Science. Um, so it's a highly cited framework. Hopefully it'll start to kind of fall down the list as more people cite the updated framework. So, you know, it'll be kind of harder to assess the citations going forward. But one of my mentor's advice to me was don't be an advocate. Okay, great. You've published the paper. Move on. And so my my head was never in the space of okay. Now we have this great framework, and now we're going to develop it and kind of advocate its use. Um, really, in my talks, I always say anything that I share today about the CIFR and how to use it, how to apply it in your work. The principles apply to any other framework. And the CIFR is not the be all end all framework for anyone, you know, everyone everywhere. <laughs> so, um, you know, I encourage people to be thoughtful about, you know, what the appropriate framework or the appropriate approach is. Mm -hmm. So it very much took on a life of its own. <laughs> and I, one thing I want to add too is that we did not recognize its true value when we. Uh, developed it. It's only kind of, um, you know, maybe a few years after its publication. And I think that its true value was in presenting and describing a language that we could use in terms of, you know, terminology and definitions. Mm -hmm. And I think it really helped us be able to articulate and communicate um, the work that needs to be done. Um, and 
yeah, that that was that was kind of a surprise to me. And and it got me thinking about, you know, theory of language and theory of, you know, how we how we the words that we use to articulate um, concepts. Right, which was so much a part of the early development of the field is what we, what even are these terms we're using? How do we define them? We've got different terms for the same thing. I mean, so much <laughs> in the early stages of any field developing, just the semantics of it all, um, you know, being pretty bewildering, maybe better <laughs> now, but there's still a lot of terminology out there for anyone <laughs> who's new to the field. I, hi, Sherry, we're so glad you're able to join. I thank you for having me. I'm sorry I was with a patient. That's okay. We knew you were you were doing your <laughs> clinical thing. It's totally, totally fine. Welcome. And we're just getting started. So welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Nice to see everybody. You too. Matt, anything you wanted to add about the, the early days? We could we could probably talk about the early days for a long time, but <laughs> early days of CFER or anything along those lines. You're on mute. <laughs> how many years into the, into this um i still don't get it um so i mean the, the thing that strikes me is when people are coming into the field and and sort of getting their feet wet they will glom on to things and sort of use them you know just whole hog and so i think um you know what we say in these like in these frameworks and the, you know it takes on a huge level of importance because it really does shape how people think about things and you know just you know when we all learn something you know usually in the beginning it's like all we can do is just to learn the basics and then as we get more comfortable you know we can then start to refine things uh, i remember the first you know when we did our first cfer project i was like well what does laura say and you know what is and like, what does Caitlin say? What does Seifer say? And like, we we tried to follow it. So like those words really do make a difference. And then as you get more comfortable, you know, then I'm like, oh, we, you know, we can start to massage things and refine things and we don't have to be so tied to every bit of it. But um, anyway, it's just a, I think it's a testament to Laura's work that, you know, those words have been just really influential and helpful. So um Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I see Lenny's question, which is a perfect transition to our uh, to our next topic, which is our focus of the beachside chat, which is, you know, where did the motivation for updating CFER come from? Um, I feel like I imagine that, you know, the decision to actually update it was a big one. Um, and so can you just talk about you know, kind of what brought you to that point and, and what kinds of decisions did you make about updating it? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. Um, I One thing that I want to say um, is that most of the work with the CFER developing the original one, and the same is true for the update, it's mostly kind of unfunded work. Um, it, it's coming, you know, from our team out and in between other projects and other funded work. Um, we got a small uh, local grant to help us with the updated version of the framework. Um, but we're really approaching this as, um, I guess, kind of a, the, a continued love of the work. Um, but what motivated us to update the CFER I think, you know, fundamentally, we always, the CFER is a living framework. And, you know, kind of what Matt was saying, you know, what, what does CFER say? And when you're first starting off, you want to be very careful about how you use it. And, you know, that's, that's kind of the mindset. But we also um, really encourage all users to assess, you know, how co uh, coherent is it? Does it promote comparison of implementation across um, studies so that we can really learn from one another? And that's one of the, that's why the, the language was so important because if we're using the same language, then Allison's work and Matt's work and Sherry's work and, and beyond can help. And even from school systems and even from farming and, and from other countries, we can all kind of compare and contrast our experiences. And 
you know, there's certainly some common themes that cut across um, regardless of the domain that you're in. And if we have the language to talk about that and learn from each other, that's really important. Um, but we want that critique. We want that, you know, and is it developing new theory? Because the CIFR is fundamentally kind of a meta theory, and it really is kind of a one-stop shop for concepts and language. But you have to bring, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but you have to bring your own theory to the table about how you're going to use the CIFR within, within your work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from the beginning, we invited that critique. And given that, you know, it was coming on 10 years, and now it's more than 10 years, 13 years, maybe, or, or 12. Um, but we really wanted to just take stock and get input from users, from people who used it in their work and get their input. We were getting feedback in the field and we, we get lots of questions from users about, well, I've got this situation, how do we use it? Or there's not a construct for this and my work doesn't really quite fit and you need to add this to the CIFR or, um, or these definitions are really confusing. How do I tell the difference between this construct and another construct? Um, so we knew that that there was room for refinement and for improvement and for learning from people in the field. Mm -hmm. And that was really our fundamental motivation. Um, there were things that we wanted to fix, that we wanted to clarify. Um, uh, definitely wanted the opportunity to flesh out the um, outer setting context more because that was very underdeveloped in the original CIFR, um, wanted to do more with the process domain. Um, now I'm getting into what are the updates that you made? Mm -hmm. But we also wanted to make it there. much more people focused as well. Um, so so I, I guess, you know, our main motivation is philosophical that this is a living framework and it needs to continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we can um, get into sort of the highlights of the updates and talk a little bit more about, you know, the expansion of outer setting process, et cetera, but just what were the areas or, you know, if, if you are in a situation like the one today of <laughs> being able to have a few moments to say, here's, here's the new, you know, new aspects of it. And also anything that may have been taken away or, or revamped, renamed, um, if you could give us a, a bit of an overview of what is new, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so um, I don't know if there is a biggest thing, but I'll, I'll, I'll venture. And in this moment, my opinion is that the biggest thing is that the CIFR is much more people oriented mm -hmm. um, in that uh, one of the just kind of pragmatic um, logistical things that we did, which is which can be the biggest point of kind of confusion or challenge in moving from the old version to the new version, is that we took all people from patients to leaders to implementation facilitators to um, clinicians and moved them all into the same domain. And we also expanded and we have a discussion about in the paper about how important it is to consider who you include in your work and to um, look for overlooked roles, for example. You know, we tend to focus a lot on physicians and nurses, for example. What about housekeeping? What about clerks? What about um, you know uh, highly engaged patients who can help to inform implementation from a patient perspective? What about outside change agents or outside leaders that are really influential um, in the work? Um, so really thinking carefully about you know casting the net as wide as you can to include anyone with influence or power, and then I add to that who should have influence or power in how an innovation is implemented. 
So really, and then that then touches on equity and consideration of equity and how important it is to bring a lens of equity um, in using the CIFR, a framework like the CIFR, because it can get very abstract. I mean, one thing that I've learned over the years, I felt like the constructs were very straightforward and very, you know, I, I mean, I, anyone would know about, you know, leadership and, and relative priority and compatibility, you know, all those concepts, but the fact is, no, that's not true. And so um, it's, it's, uh, I forgot where I was going with that, but to <laughs> use, to use language and bring, you know, the language down or to the place where the people are and having these conversations and involving people in a way that has impact and meaning um, for implementation. And definitely, I just want to make a pitch, you know, for the importance of equity is that, you know, we want to make sure that we are leveraging every opportunity to improve equity and not making it worse. And I'm going to venture to say that it's not good enough just to not make it worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to you know keep status quo okay well we haven't done more damage than is already being done so um but anyway to to really bring those considerations in mm -hmm. um like i said earlier we expanded the um the number of constructs within the outer setting um there were four constructs one of the constructs mm -hmm. is what i call the kitchen sink construct where it had everything from performance measurement to finance and uh, 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 quality collaboratives, um, but we split all of those out separately. Um, and, you know, you can look at the list. I'm not going to go into detail, but I think a couple of, well, actually I have a lot of favorite babies within the CFER, <laughs> but, you know, one of them in terms of um, adding the, the uh, uh, constructs related to local attitudes and local conditions, really allows us to look at, especially for community-based implementations, you know, are, are the resources there? Is the infrastructure within the outer setting there? Are the people in the inner setting involved or engaged within the work? And who are those um, people? And so that, again, you know, comes to the people part. Um, and then in terms of attitudes, is there a bias against helping you know, this population or neighborhood versus other um, populations or neighborhoods. Um, it can get into political rifts. It can get into um, uh, information technology, internet access, for example. Um, uh, some other changes, we vastly expanded the process domain as well. So we had four constructs that kind of roughly followed the quality improvement PDSA, the plan do follow, uh, plan do study act cycles of change. Mm -hmm. um, we still have those, although instead of executing, we call it doing. So that kind of is getting closer to that cycle. But we've also added some activities that I think we've got consensus on within implementation science, things like um, doing context assessment, doing the needs assessment, um, adapting and how important adapting and iterative adapting is, um, just to mention a few. Another theme that is another one of my favorites that is woven much more specifically into the CIFR is the idea of teams and the importance of teams. So it's not just what I call the hero model of implementation. If you really wanna focus on sustainment, long-term use and optimization, of an innovation, we really need to take team-based approaches to implementation. We can't just rely on that hero nurse who is doing everything. And when she leaves or takes another job, um, everything falls apart or comes to a, a, a halt. Um, and so the, the more we can take or are able to take a team-based approach, um, I would assert that the more, and this is a hypothesis that's an empirical question, but the, um, the, the more sustainable um, our work would be. Um, those are ones that I would highlight. I guess, Matt or Sherry, do you have favorites that you would like to highlight? <laughs> um, 
not necessarily favorites, but I a, a, a more meta point about how, you, you know, uh, CIFR is sort of a, an assessment, but like a lot of assessments, it shows you kind of what the quote, you know, the more right answers are. Like it shows you, it guides you on some of the things that might be good to do. And so I think the implementation process domain in particular now has a bunch of strategies, some that, you know, are very close to what Eric, you know, like sort of the high, Eric highlights basically, or Eric um, sort of greatest hits on, you know, if you do a bunch of these things, you'll be in good shape. Um, so I think it guides as much as that is, it assesses. Mm -hmm. I, for me, I love how the individual's domain includes some more built out behavior change theories from the combi. Um, I think a lot of people before were asking me, how do you put the two together? And it's just beautiful that I that you put it in. And then I also really like the built out external pressures because I think that in particular peer pressure was sort of a thing that was hard to explain to people, but also, you know, how it could be positive or negative in that sense. Yeah. Um, and so I really like how there's all the different external pressures that I think are relevant to a lot of stakeholders or partners. Yeah, one more thing that I'll add is that we, even for constructs where we made relatively minor changes, we shifted the language so that it is now consistent across the entire framework to word the definition so that you can ask yourself to what extent, and then dot, dot, dot. So to what extent is this a high priority relative to other initiatives happening? Um, before, like Sherry alluded to, we had constructs, some constructs were descriptive, some constructs were um, kind of hinted that if you have this, that's a good thing, but then other constructs, it was, I think we had a few negative constructs in there, um, that if you had a lot of it, it would not be a good thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but we also explicitly acknowledged that the responses to this, and the, and the CIFR, I want to say, is really, um, really best suited for qualitative work. So, you know, these are open-ended questions, but they also form the basis for developing quantitative questions too, um, which we do not, just for the record, there is not a set of CIFR, uh, a complete comprehensive set of CIFR quantitative questions. Um, we have pieces and parts, and you can go to the website for a few of those. Um, but that is an area that that needs for, you know, continues to need further development. But just acknowledging, again, you know, uh, focusing on people is that the work that we do with a framework like the CIFR is an opportunity to amplify the voices at the front line. The people who are really struggling day to day to put this stuff together and make it work and get all their colleagues to do it, get the pieces, you know, matching together, get the workflows redesigned. You know, this, this work really needs to amplify their voices um, because we know that there are a lot of other voices and messaging going on as well. Um, for example, you know, maybe higher placed individuals, leaders who um, make assumptions <laughs> um, and don't necessarily understand, you know, what really, what it really takes to do the implementation. And so one of the, the, the goals, and I think the, the um, I, I'll even say kind of ethical obligations is to bring those voices out. And the reason that I'm bringing this out at this time is just to say that every construct is you know the responses and the insights that we gain um, are a combination of kind of you know reality. Do you have a medical record system? Yes, you know you can look at it and say, yep, you've got one. But is it helpful? Is it a barrier? Is it you know uh, is it going to be you know whatever all the questions um, related where the medical record system. Um, it's, you know, kind of the, the barriers, the challenges, or the um, facilitators related to that will be a matter of perceptions. You know, nurses may have one perception versus physicians versus clerks versus, 
you know, leadership or, or quality, you know, performance managers. Um, so it's important to understand those perspectives also so that we can um, respect and um, kind of react or work with, you know, across those um, different perspectives. Um, super helpful. And I see people are, uh, you know, pointing out their favorites as well in the chat. Um, and I was really, I was excited about the innovation recipients uh, build out too, because that has been a question um, that I've grappled with in my work and that I get asked a lot about is, well, what do we do about the patient behavior change piece of things? Like, is that, you know, somewhere else? Is that in CIFR? Do we, you know, yeah. and it kind of relates to um, another set of questions too, just about kind of using the framework, combining it with others, um, using parts of it. Can we get into that a little bit about using it? Yeah. Where you go for what and that type of thing? Yeah, I would love to start with your implied question of what do we do with innovation recipients or, you know, people we call patients. Yeah. Um, it could be students within schools. It could be farmers. It could be, you know, it could be physicians for that matter, because there are innovations that are uh, that are aimed at, you know, physician behavior change or anyone else. Anyway, so let's just talk about patients. Um, we did also, you know, just so everyone knows, we published a, a companion paper that actually preceded the updated CIFR paper that we called the outcomes addendum, the CIFR outcomes addendum. And um, in there, in that paper, we did make conceptual distinctions between innovation determinants versus implementation determinants. And I felt a little uncomfortable about drawing a line. And Allison, this gets to your, you know, to I think the conundrum that you were articulating is that, you know, as implementation scientists and as we're getting more and more into hybrid work where we're having to show both innovation, you know, effectiveness simultaneous or concurrent with implementation strategy effectiveness. Um, we don't, I don't want to say that the innovation recipient doesn't matter. It's not, that's not what we're saying. Anywhere the words come close to saying something like that, we're just trying to draw, we're just trying to bracket the utility of the CIFR itself. The CIFR itself is focused on implementation. If it, you know, it, it would be ideal if patients help design implementation help design workflows that support our implementation work. Um, but then when it comes to the point of actually delivering this pre, you know, all right, I'm gonna say, let's say the world is a perfect place and we have our evidence base of clinical trials and we have a well-defined innovation. We know exactly the boundaries of that innovation and exactly the components of the innovation. All of the things like, you know, demographics that affect outcomes for patients, um, their lived, you know, experience and context, their own characteristics, their health, their, you know, all of those factors we loosely refer to as innovation characteristics. And these are factors that are traditionally captured in uh, frameworks like the theoretical domains framework or like social determinants of, of change or health belief models. There are a hundred health behavior change models already out there, already defined with relationships defined that are hypothesis. You can, you can test hypotheses with these, um, with these other models, not with the, with the theoretical domains framework, but with other more specific ones. We did not want to, we do not want to reinvent that whole decades and decades of science. And so like Sherry alluded to, what we did with the updated CIFR is to provide a portal. So we included characteristics of individuals that include capability, opportunity, and motivation. So it's C-O-M, that the three of those um, will influence behavior. So this is a kind of a meta model that Susan Mickey and colleagues developed. Those 
constructs, the capability, the opportunity, the motivation are mapped in the literature to the theoretical domains framework, which has, I don't know, 70 something constructs over 14 different domains. And so the extent to which, because we are doing hybrid work, we are paying attention to the innovation and implementation at the same time. But making, being, defining up front, what are the patient related determinants that you may take from either the combi model or more specifically from the theoretical domains or health belief model, whatever, um, and combining that with constructs in, in a way of thinking about the CIFR might be um, at least a, a piece of it, a big piece of it is what are the contextual things that can influence implementation? Or another way to put it is what are the things that are kind of collectively generated? So for example, a construct within um, the, the theoretical domains framework might be, um, is this, as a patient, is this change aligned with my priorities um, or my values or, um, you know, is it important for me? Um, within the CIFR, the question would be, how important is this within the organization, which is going to be a collective perception of the leadership importance placed on doing this implementation. So there's like contextual within the context, within your workplace, within where the thing is being delivered. Those are the things that the CIFR captures, is designed to capture versus patients who are in their own environment. They're outside the delivery environment. So one way that, that I've come to think of this is to think about the delivery side of the equation and then the recipient side of the uh, equation. And the CIFR is designed for the delivery side of the equation. Absolutely, in case you didn't get the uh, impression, I totally support combining frameworks. Um, but whether you're using one framework or six, <laughs> you have to be very clear about the rationale for each theory that you're bringing to the table, how it is informing your work, operationalizing, which in the updated CIFR, we have a lot more emphasis on the absolute essential need to define your innovation, you know, for each of the domains in the CIFR. So divide, define the thing that's being implemented, especially where the boundaries are with how you're defining that thing with the strategies that are being used to put it in place. So in another way to think about this is what are the things that need to be persistent beyond your implementation efforts? versus the things that need to be present in order to do those initial activities and you know, potentially optimization activities um, to get those components to be persistent, to be routinized, to be deeply embedded into this is how we do things. Um, all right, I, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll pause there, but I, well, actually one more thing. A really important um, area, there are a lot of future areas to, you know, that we need to be working toward, but it's the relationships between the constructs. So how does relative priority relate to the availability of resources, relate to the time people have and the capacity um, you know, for implementing or delivering um, the innovation? So you can bring other theories to the table that help to uh, guide selection of a smaller set of constructs, you know, versus the, I have to admit, I've hesitated counting the number of constructs in the new CIFR because it's really kind of feels even to me a little overwhelming. So don't count them, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but but bringing in theory is one way, one way for selecting a narrower set of constructs. And if you're hypothesizing relationships, that's what those additional theories can do um, by combining it, you know, with the CIFR. Yeah, I would usually, I, I try to steer folks away from using six. <laughs> Just because. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can't, <laughs> no, and I know I mean, you reviewers six, are not but... going to um, right. fund that, uh, to be honest. Although reviewers are getting better about three, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I try to keep it to <laughs> two, maybe three, but but I think your point about, you know, what being really clear about what the purpose is, if you are bringing in another one, why, um, what is it offering that the the other one doesn't offer, and you know, carrying that through the entire study design, measurement, et cetera, is it's tricky. It's a lot of moving parts, so you know, we don't want to go overboard and. So many models and frameworks out there do cover so much territory, probably none better than the C for really, because it's so comprehensive. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, Sherry, other thoughts about using C for using it in combination with other models, frameworks, um, tips, strategies, anything along those lines? Um, um, so okay. I, guess, I, 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 I guess I'm going to let Matt fall on the sword for that one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I try to, um, you know, it's sort of a case by case basis for, you know, whatever the project, uh, demands. Um, I mean, I've used Cipher with Reaim, I've used Cipher with iParis, um, so, uh, use Cipher with getting to outcomes, so, uh, it really just depends on, uh, you know, sort of what you're interested in. And so I think it's always good to know what the facilitators and the barriers are, which is, you know, if you had to like, I think boil Seaver down to its like most uh, basic thing. Uh, so, you know, that pairs, it's like a, a very flexible wine, you know, it could, it pairs well with, any, you know, with lots of things because um, it's really good to be, you know, you know, we're trying to match uh, strategies to what these, you know, the barriers of facilitators are. So, um, you know, that I, I'd like to do that. And so whatever, however, this, whatever strategy formulation, whether it's from Paris or Eric, um, you know, it just pairs well with a lot of those frameworks. Mm -hmm. Sherry, anything you want to add? No, I think from my perspective, it's really interesting because what I love about especially the updated CIFR is that even for people who don't have a lot of theory basis, like people like me who come through more the clinical pathway, um, I think it makes a lot of sense. So it's very pragmatic as well as theory driven. And so I think that it's easy to learn. And I and um, I think the things that I was combining it the most with were the combi, which is now in, and also reaim, which I think the outcomes addendum does sort of speak to. So it's nice. And I see we have a question. What stages of intervention development would be most appropriate and beneficial to use CIFR? Would it be appropriate to use it in early development and refinement phase before efficacy and effectiveness trials? This really gets a, an interesting question because the question is around or focused on the thing. I mean, the use of the term, what stage of intervention development. So um, my perception, I, I think the questioner and, and add to the chat if I'm getting your question wrong, um, the person who entered that. But um, if you're talking about intervention development, so you're trying to develop an intervention, let's say to you know, reduce hospital readmissions among, you know, a certain group of patients with a diagnostic group or something, characteristics. Um, that the CIFR is not necessarily um, an appropriate framework for that, but I also want to say, this is getting, I'm pushing the envelope here, okay? This is not traditional. I, I, 
it's more and more important, I think, for us to be user centered in the design of the intervention, which, which means we need to take into account not only like the patients that would be the future recipients of a new intervention, which the theoretical domains framework would be a more appropriate one for that if you wanna be able to understand patient characteristics that may influence um, effective uh, efficacy of an intervention. Um, but if you want to develop an intervention in tandem with how do we how do we design this in a way that can be quickly, easily implemented? Then when you're in the design phase to not pay attention only to patients and what their outcomes are likely to be, but also to include and understand the clinicians and the supporting roles for clinicians to be able to best serve those patients. So the CFR could help you ask questions about, you know, in the current state, clearly there's a gap in what the patients are experiencing, you know, you're wanting to improve care or improve their outcomes in some way by creating a new intervention. Understanding the context in which this thing will be delivered would help to accelerate use of that intervention if you do find that it is effective. And honestly, Anytime you're conducting a clinical trial, and there was um, uh, uh, actually a couple of papers that have been published about using the CFR with randomized control trials, mm -hmm. because as trialists, and I've done trials of interventions, you are implementing it. You're implementing it in all of your study sites. And for those of you who have done multi-center trials, you know that the travails and the successes are not the same <laughs> and the outcomes are not the same across the centers because their contexts are so different. So the extent to which we can understand those differences, the CIFR can help you do that. But having said all this, I don't wanna mislead you that this is a traditional <laughs> approach for, you know, kind of intervention development for RCTs. I, I, I really, um, I liked it as a, as like an early development stage. So I, I did a project uh, when Allison and I were together in LA a bunch of years ago before CIFR was a thing um, where the VA was going to be introducing peer specialists. And so I went around the country and just asked people, hey, you know, there are these people called peer specialists. What would you think if they came and joined and became part of the system? And I gave like sort of an outline of what peer specialists were. And it's, it's very similar to this concept or, or this idea of concept testing in industry, like, you know, like when uh, a company wants to road test a new product, they'll develop like a, the product in the, you know, in the lab or not release it yet, bring people in, give it to them and get that early feedback. And it was, um, I wish when I was doing that project, I had CIFR to guide me in my, you know, putting together the qualitative interview. Um, I think we did learn a lot of information that we went on to be useful, but um, I, I do really think it can be useful in this sort of concept testing, uh, concept testing way. And it also depends, I think, if it's, um, and Sherry and I have talked about this in terms of sometimes like an innovation is a completely new thing, right? Like the system is not doing any of it and we want them to start. Other times it's more like, the system is actually knows about the quote innovation, knows about the clinical practice. We just want them to do it better, more, more equitably distributed, you know. And so that's it. And so in the latter situation, I think you can ask 
more questions that then people will have answers to more readily because they'll be like, oh yeah, that thing, I know we're not doing it as much as we should because of, you know, you know, this Seifert construct, this Seifert thing. And so, you know, they'll have that more direct experience, I think, to speak to. So I think it is hugely helpful, uh, you know, to do upfront, you know, sometimes you don't have the time, the money, the people or whatever to do that, but it is, I'm, I'm a fan. Many applications. Yeah, and and I wonder. I think you can even just look at the characteristics of the innovation, and as you're developing your intervention, just mm -hmm. remember that keeping it simple makes it more implementable. Things like that. So from that perspective as well. There's some. I think there's some interesting potential papers there. Um, okay, I see a question. Ooh. I know we don't have too much time left. Um, so maybe we can do this question quickly and possibly one more, we'll see. Um, but I see Marlena's question about how to reconcile differences if I'm using the C for Eric matching tool, given the updates, will there be updates made to the matching tool? <laughs> and maybe that does lead well to our next <laughs> Our final closing question, which is what's on the horizon for Seifer? And that's my favorite topic, Marlena. It's like I paid you, but I didn't. I, did, I didn't. We're totally above board here. Yep. No. Um, so uh, we are actually really excited to think about how to work on the matching tool, um, not just to update it between uh, original Seifer and updated Seifer, which uh, they have a really nice um table on the website where you can and in the paper where you can map the old to the new uh constructs within cfer but we also have we've been collecting a lot of eric strategy data over the last almost 10 years now and um so we're really looking to figure out how to use some data to inform that decision about how you select strategies. And so if people are interested in that, we're really excited about thinking about how to do that and how to you build upon all of the work of experts and opinions of experts with sort of real world data to provide um, a decision aid that's helpful to all different types of people in the field. So call us, we're really, we wanna talk about it with everybody. And we might have a grant to support all this work. Maybe, yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, so we have a VA uh, kind of a merit grant that's going to focus on all the stuff that Sherry just said. So hopefully that will got a, good, a decent score at the third try. And uh, um, so we're really excited. But um, could you, I mean, the more data that we can get from the field, um, the, the the smarter the decision aid will be. So we're you know we're looking for that. And also, um, I know CIFR is pretty much lives in a qualitative um, tradition, but uh, we also, as part of that grant, want to think about use, uh, creating a CIFR survey. That's a little you know to, just another tool in the tool bag um, to to for people. And so. Uh, that project would then fund us also to then compare on us on the same project the quality like the full bore qualitative results to a quantitative survey to make sure that the survey is valid um you know so it has construct uh, validity um so that's another thing that's um uh, potentially on the horizon and i think in the spirit of hearing from everybody getting people's voices involved and sort of a justice ethical perspective you know being able to collect data from a lot of different people um, using something simple as a starting point it does offer sort of a nice uh first step what we've we've been doing is sort of starting with a quick survey which is not it's like a very alpha e version like it's not ready for prime time, and then going and talking to people so that it helps us focus down which of the constructs to really talk about when we only have 20 minutes of a provider's time um, or a scheduler's time or somebody working in a busy system. And so uh, thinking about how to do that 
and do it well is um, important. And so, I, you know, we have like two of the best qualitative methodologists sitting right here. I'm like, we're not going to say that the survey would ever replace the voice of the person, um, but it's just another way to try to get more people engaged and have have a voice at the table. That's exciting. Very exciting. Um, I'm sure we could keep going for several more hours, but I know we're getting to the top of the hour. Um, Elena, would you mind bringing up the slides again? Thank you so much. So we just wanted to share a few. This is a just tiny drop uh, in the ocean of the incredible volume of papers out there on CIFR. Um, so the main paper uh, is at the top, the updated CIFR, the paper about uh, the CIFR outcomes addendum is there. I highly recommend Laura's Clarity Out of Chaos paper. I can't even tell you how many times I've said that to people. If you want to understand, like, why do we even care about theory? How do we use it in implementation research? And then a couple of other uh, really, really interesting papers of that um, Matt and uh, Shari contributed to, um, and also a paper about uh, race conscious adaptation of the CIFR, which I think is really interesting, given um, the points that were made during our chat about using an equity lens uh, with the CIFR. Um, so I don't want it to end, but I know everyone has to go off to um, their other engagements today. I want to thank Laura, Matt, and Sherry so much for being here with us today. This was fascinating and outstanding, and your work has just been amazing in this thank space. You. And um, We're also appreciative of all the contributions that you've made and, and of course, being incredible colleagues as well uh, for everyone in attendance. This will be posted on our YouTube playlist. All of our past, uh, almost all of our past Beachside chats and workshops can be found there. There's a lot um, and we hope that it's of value to you. If you have any questions, reach out to us and please do complete our super quick evaluation that we'll send to you uh, in just a little bit so we can keep these going. Um, but thank you all for being here. And thank you again to Laura, Matt and Sherry for um, this absolutely fantastic beachside chat so thank you and have a great rest of your day take good care everyone thank you so much thank you all Bye -bye. thanks for having us bye, bye.